Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. I am Lorraine Cote Vasquez. I'm the commissioner of the New York City Department for the Aging, the largest area agency on aging in the United States. Welcome. I cannot think of a time, a more critical juncture than now to launch this ageism uh, conversation, a time when society, as a society, we are looking at all of the things that have separated us, marginalized individuals, or even uh, excluded individuals. A time when all the sectors in society, private, nonprofit, and government are looking at diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, and this is the time that we wanna combat and take a striking blow on the la one of the last human rights crises called ageism. I am thrilled that we are doing this in partnership with AARP National and AARP New York. They are the leaders, AARP is the leaders in the aging space. And we thank you for all your years of unflinching advocacy and expertise. The 2020 census has revealed what many of us in the aging space have been predicting for the last decade, that the number of older Americans this decade have outpaced the growth of the working class, uh, the working age population. Outpaced the growth in the age population. This phenomena is not unique to the United States, it is global. This world will soon have more older people than younger people. That has some major implications globally and things that we have to consider structurally and also on some of our policies. Agents, uh, ageism not only affects individuals in the workplace, but it also affects the economy as a whole. AARP has been a leader in talking about the longevity of, uh, economy, and we're looking forward uh, to more on this. The other thing that I wanted to say is combating and eliminating ageism now is imperative. As I said earlier, it is a human rights crisis. It is something that each and every one of us experiences. And as I've always said, everyone wants to age. From the day we were born, we were aging. Everyone wants to age till about the age of 16. You can't wait to advance to the next age. And then something starts happening around 47. And society starts making the conversation change around 47. I want to just say that I am proud of the work that the AARP Foundation has done on these extensive studies as how uh, ageism is affecting not only the economy, but the workplace. We have, for the first time in decades, a real opportunity to strike a blow on ageism. Together, you will meet today some of the leaders in diversity, inclusion, and uh, in the workplace and also in AARP. These are leaders who, who represent us throughout the United States. What I'm really interested about is that New York City has always been known to be one of the cities that advances uh, uh, a, a friendly aging. New York City, has, as a matter of fact, is a global leader and model on um, age-friendly uh, living. And that's why this conversation needed to be had and held in New York with AARP as its partner. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Beth Finkel, who is the state director for AARP in New York. Beth has been a tireless champion for older adults. Most recently, AARP New York, after decades of advocacy on access to private retirement uh, savings, New York's Governor Hochul recently signed a secure choice bill into law. That was possible because of Beth and AARP's uh, efforts, ensuring that millions of New Yorkers will have an easy way to save for their future. Bravo, Beth and AARP New York. Welcome, Beth. Thank you. Thank you, Lorraine. I'm so happy to be part of this with you today. And I'm very excited to be able to um, talk to you and thank you for 
leading our Age Friendly Commission and all the wonderful work that we have been doing on the Age Friendly Commission. And you can hear that resonate with all the points that we're going to go through right now. So ARP, again, is thrilled to be here to join the New York City Department for the Aging, the discussion about uh, an issue that keeps growing more important as our city and state and nation keep growing older, ageism, a diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging approach. Already people 50 and older account for nearly a third of New York City's population, and they are a driving force in our economy, cultural life, and civic engagement. They account for the city's biggest volunteer base, and they represent the largest voting bloc. And yet ageism is all around us in viral videos that belittle aging politicians and ads that glamorize youth and in job descriptions that require digital natives. Negative stereotypes and mistaken assumptions often lead to older people being treated unfairly from stores to restaurants, from rental apartments, to mortgage lenders, to the workplace. Today's forum is much about a mindset as anything else. We need to challenge the way we think about aging. ARP is working to challenge outdated beliefs and create solutions that enable people to choose how they live as they age. We believe that people can achieve their dreams at any age. And there are also practical things we can do in Congress, state capitals, and right here at City Hall. We're urging the United States Senate to follow the House and pass Protect Older Workers Against Discrimination Act. We are pushing state houses, including Albany, for new laws. For example, in Connecticut, they just passed a new law that prohibits employers for asking for graduation and birth rate dates on applications. Experienced workers have expertise, maturity, and perspective. Yet when you survey 50 plus, they witness at least 50% witness age discrimination related to age. And also nearly 20% say they were passed over for a job because of their age. While 10% said they were laid off or fired due to their age. Lorraine has been an incredible champion for the New York City Department for the Aging. And she has moved forward with a lot of great policies that she started and we need to complete. So we need a comprehensive updated program for the city's 50 plus population to prevent and mitigate and respond to disasters. Um, we need our next mayor to have a deputy mayor to lead a powerful task force dedicated to aging. The city must enforce anti-ageism laws and broaden the task force on racial inclusion and equity. And the city needs to have more training. Lorraine has been working tirelessly on this. We also need to make sure that the city thinks about renaming the Department for the Aging. I mean, let's just think about it. It's called the New York City Department for the Aging. I think it's time for us to move into the modern age and underscore positivity in how we talk about aging New Yorkers. Boston, for example, has a commission, uh, has, uh, has renamed theirs uh, Age Strong. So finally, I get to turn over this to a wonderful moderator, someone I think we all know a ABC 7 Sandra Bookman. She's won three Emmy Awards, including coverage of the Olympics. And she also, um, I know you all see her on Eyewitness News, and I also watch here and now, and I hope you do too. And she's just a wealth of knowledge on all things New York. So welcome and thank you, Sandra, so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Beth. Um, and like most New Yorkers, this is a conversation that I am very interested in because we are all headed that way, aging, hopefully well, you know, as time goes on. I'm going to give you a quick overview of what we're hoping to discuss and accomplish during this segment. And then I want to introduce our very distinguished panelists. Now, people, you guys have all said it, people are living longer and there are now five generations that are having a chance to work side by side. Research shows that multi-generational teams increase productivity and worker engagement while lowering absenteeism. But in a recent AARP survey, 78% of workers ages 45 and over said they have seen or experienced age discrimination in the workplace. A 2015 annual global CEO study found that 64% of firms had diversity and inclusion strategies, but only 8% of them included age. Noted gerontologist, Dr. Erdman Palmore has called ageism the third great ism in our society after racism and sexism. 
The time now is to dismantle this ism as well. Joining us today, again, a distinguished group of panelists that will share their expertise and solutions as we examine the need to include age in DEIB efforts. Joining us, you've met her, Lorraine Cortez Vasquez. See, she is the commissioner of the New York City Department for the Aging. Edna Kane Williams, executive vice president and chief diversity officer with AARP. Daisy O'Shea Dominguez, Chief People Officer for Vice Media Group. Jason Rosario, Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer, BBDO Worldwide. And Irtia Dinzi Flores. She is the Vice President, DEI, Social Impact and Sustainability Person for Just Works. Thank you all for being with us this afternoon. And the first question, I am going to start off with Edna, Ms. Mm -hmm. Kane Williams. You have spent uh, 15 years of leadership at AAR AARP. And of course, AARP is the leader in the aging space about ra and raising awareness and advocating for uh, older adults. You were recently appointed to a chief, the position of chief diversity officer. And it's a new position for the organization, I understand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about why now and, and what is the vision? Sure. Uh, thank you so much, Sandra and Lorraine and Beth. Uh, uh, not so well kept secret. Um, uh, I follow in Lorraine's footsteps. She um, led great efforts in the multicultural marketing space at AARP, and I'm always very grateful to her and my colleague, Beth Finkel, uh, the State Director of New York. So one of the key points I want to make, and I just alluded to it, that even though this is a new position, AARP has not necessarily had a position called Chief Diversity equity and inclusion officer, we have been working in the multicultural space for more than 10, 15 years. So we had a good grounding in the space, but uh, recent events nationally and where we are as a country, the confluence of, of uh, uh, lots of opinions and, and uh, events led AARP, like many other organizations, to sort of rethink our positioning in the space. And what I can say is the chief diversity officer at AARP, I'm shortening it, but it is the title is chief diversity, equity, and inclusion. The, the landscape is broader, looking at, at diversity issues, not only diversity issues, but issues with around inclusion and equity, and also, as you mentioned, Sandra, uh, belonging. So we're recognizing, as are many companies, that you have to have a comprehensive approach uh, to these issues. You can't just pull out one key thing and focus on it. Mm -hmm. You're not focusing on the total landscape you're not doing a great job. And I'm really, I committed when I took this job to help AARP be a model DEI organization. And that means a number of things. One of the things that it absolutely means is including ageism as a part of that uh, 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 landscape. Sandra, again, you mentioned that many companies are not actively, don't actively include ageism as an area that they focus on when they talk about diversity. Uh, and yet, uh, for the first time in the country's history, we have workplaces, you said briefly, that, rep, that, that encompass five generations. We have the silent uh, generation, boomers, uh, generation Gen X, uh, millennials, and Gen Z. And to have that kind of mixture in the workplace uh, where everybody can thrive and benefit and, and uh, uh, advance takes intentionality. And many companies don't have the training uh, programs in place, don't have the recognition that uh, having five generations in the workplace uh, requires a different approach. So AARP, we've really spent a lot of time in the last couple of years, we're developing training programs for the workplace. We're advocating around um, age discrimination and uh, other policy solutions. But one of the key points I also wanna make is it goes uh, we're looking at it. Yes, we're AARP, and we're focused on people over the age of 50, but we're really focused on workers. We're really focused on people and their families. So this issue of ages, ageism uh, crosses uh, all of the, the um, 
uh, generations that I mentioned. And we want all of the generations, whether you're Gen X, Gen Z, silent, boomer, millennial, to be able to thrive in the workplace. And that's gonna take a lot more from all of us than we currently see happening. Not even all chief diversity officers are focusing on ageism. And that's another part of our mandate, if you will, over the next uh, several years is to make sure that that, that uh, DEI automatically includes a focus on ageism. And just a quick question for you to follow up. And is it your thought that businesses aren't focusing on ageism as one of those isms because this is the first time we've had so many generations or we've just never called folks out about the fact that sometimes um, older uh, workers are seen as more disposable? Yeah, I think there's a bit of both. I think this is a unique inflection point for the country to have so many uh, generations in the workplace, but I also don't think for whatever reasons we've all, we've uh, a focus on age discrimination, the rampant age discrimination that we also see to the extent that we have some of the other in isms. I'll end with this uh, anecdote. Uh, Lorraine knows this, I uh, have a, a new grandson. I was babysitting him this weekend. I, I promise this is related. Watched a lot of <laughs> Nick Jr. in the background. And there's a commercial about a, a doll that's a granny sitting in a, in a in like a, a plastic chair, has lots of stuff in her lap and the kids take turns. She's sleeping and they take turns picking things out of her lap. And then um, you lose the game when she wakes up, her teeth fly out of her mouth. Uh, and and that's sort of the gotcha. I mean, and, and Nick Jenner's for three-year-olds. So if we're presenting that, I'm, I'm ready to write a letter because it really is awful. And I saw it repeatedly um, over the weekend. It's like, we're already, you know, um, socializing children to see yeah. one, it was, they all laughed. When the, mm -hmm. when the teeth fell out, they were like sneaky, like, oh, let's pick the thing. So that's a negative um, uh, uh, ages stereotype that we have been uh, promoting for years. We need to focus on it better. Okay. Uh, and that does illustrate why this ism is one that needs to be addressed. Lorraine, I want to bring you back into the conversation. Obviously, um, you've been leading systems uh, when it comes to changes around how we think about ages aging for a long time at the uh, New York City Department for the aging most recently. We're curious to hear your thoughts when it comes to the status of the public sector and how it relates to ageism and what steps are being taken or perhaps should be taken, especially when we talk, uh, you know, through the lens of a prob public private partnership. Perfect, thank you for the uh, question. I think there are two things. I think we want to do an internal landscape as to where we have age requirements uh, for retirement in the public sector and what are the reasons for those um, and, and, and try to work with the, uh, with the private sector and the public sector as to where, where and how and when should we eliminate those. I think that's one. And, and now I'm gonna say to you, I wanna go back to you, write that letter because we did yeah. the same thing to Disney when we started looking at the way Disney was portraying, it's old Disney uh, products were always portraying uh, older people as scary and negative. And then when they started going into the multicultural market, they started honoring age. And I wanted to show them that distinction. They were quite interested. Their response was quite interesting, yeah, good. Good. but I nevertheless, um, ages. Um, yeah. But yes, I think, I think it's a conversation with the public and private sector. Um, Sandra, to go back to your point, uh, and I think the same way we wanna do an internal scan as to where we have age uh, retirement uh, requirements, that we would like the entire sector to do that because we know that it's universities, judges, and many of those. And ability is not determined by age. Ability is ageless, as we constantly say. And so until we start getting people to see ability as ageless, we can make those kind of shifts. And the fact that we're having that this conversation, um, do you feel like that the, that's, a, that's sort of already out there, this whole idea? I mean, I've heard the discussion before, why should I have to retire at 65 or 67 or whatever it is now if I can still to, do my job? Um, d are we open? to doing that? Or do you still, ex still expect that there's going to be pushback on it? 
I think there's going to be tremendous pushback. But when we have allies and partners like you, like Edna, like Daisy, like Ithia, like Jason, who will take on and, and, and push forward and say, and AARP has done this for yeah. decades in the saying, absolutely not. Ability is ageless. Let's look at the things that get in the way of people being productive parts of the workforce. And as Edna says, we need to train you so that you can see the benefit and the impact of the uh, longevity economy. Everybody wins when you, everybody, we always have the conversation now about diversity of thought, right? And <laughs> diversity of, of thought in terms of creativity uh, and profitability. Well, diversity of thought also includes age. Yeah. And, uh, and that's what we need to start shifting the conversation from a deficit model to an asset model. Okay. I see people shaking their heads, including Daisy. I see you shaking your I, head. I there. was going to say, I'm so sorry. Can I take a little bit of Lorraine's stage and just chime in a little bit before you no, go? No, that's question? why you're here. We want oh, your thank you. Go thank ahead. you, Sandra. So I was just going to say, Lorraine, I think there's also another salient point in what you were saying. And since I'm sort of representing this sort of youngish tech sector here, there's another aspect of being able to work later into life that it is related to the advancements that we've made in technology and the ability that that provides us to be, you know, sort of workers in the economy for a much longer time and productive in different ways. And so I, I do think that there's another aspect of this that is really about how do you marry that experience, right? Mm -hmm. And that diversity of thought and leadership with the ability that we now have as a society to actually arm people, right? And provide the resources for them to be more productive into um, longer into their lifetimes, let's say. So I just, I, there is an opportunity there. Yeah, so we're actually technologically making the way, but we haven't changed our mindset quite exactly. Right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. All right. So we've heard from the public and nonprofit sectors. We're going to move to the private sector now. We're going to bring Daisy and Jason into the conversation. Now, you both have long and impressive accomplishments in the diversity and inclusion space. You're currently, obviously, advertising and the media. Um, and these sectors have had their challenges with ageist mes messaging. Yet it is this sector that could also be the way of uh, be the catalyst for changing all of our perceptions about what aging means. Can you both share challenges that you've seen in your own sectors with ageism and what you're currently working on to try to help change the, the narrative and our mindsets? Um, Daisy, you can go first. <laughs> so I was gonna ask Jason to go first because okay. he's got All a right. really great point of view from the ad agency world that I think would be a really nice uh, umbrella. Jason? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you, uh, Daisy. It's such a pleasure to share another space with you. And, you know, to all of the rest of the panelists, uh, excited to have this conversation because, you know, one, we're doing a lot from an advertising standpoint. Uh, but I also think that a lot of what's being discussed right now in terms of the mindset shift that needs to happen, uh, a lot of that responsibility really falls on us, uh, myself as an advertiser and as a storyteller uh, and, and Daisy as a, as a media professional, you know, we are the stewards of culture, right? We are the narrators of history. Uh, and so we have a responsibility, quite frankly, to start to shift that narrative over time. So let me share a little bit about um, how we're working, uh, not only internally at BBDO to, to help shape that narrative, but also ironically enough, actually before I was uh, invited to this panel, um, AERP is one of our largest clients. And so I think it'd be great to share with you a little bit about um, you know, not only how we're working with AARP, but also what we're putting out in the marketplace in conjunction with the company to kind of start to shape uh, the, the future that we want to live in. So. You know, in a world that uh, that has brands wanting to be more more youthful or wanting to appear more youthful, um, of course, there there are uh, barriers there that we need to address. And we've all heard the term, well, age is just a number. But what does that really mean, right? Uh, what what does that mean exactly? And so that's part of what we're trying to redefine uh, with some of the marketing campaigns that we've uh, created for for AARP. Um, and that's all backed by an insight that I think if yeah, you, you mentioned, which is people are living longer. Right. And there's a book that we've all read internally called The Hundred Year Life. 
that's really started to shape our thinking around how we approach this work. Uh, so I, one, I would encourage everyone to pick it up because I think it's it's um, ama an amazing read, but also really start to really shed, shed light into kind of some of the thinking and the nuances around ageism as it were. Um, but you know, one of the things that I'm really proud of is that our team is really thinking about not only our responsibility um, to shape that world and redefine ageism, but really also link it to something that Daisy will talk about, which is how do we start to bring young people into this conversation in a much more salient, important way. So I'd love to share, if we have time, a, a quick spot that we've developed for AARP that's currently out in the market that illustrates exactly how we're bringing all of those insights together. So um, uh, the team, uh, I'm not sure if the team is ready for that with that video. If not, I can keep I can keep talking. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. The moment you realize you are ready for what's next in your career, that's when we start planning it together. Let's start planning earlier for a career that lives longer. So quick spot, this is what's out in the market right now as far as storytelling goes. But again, what you'll see in that spot are a couple of things. One uh, is really centering um, and being, I think someone referenced it as uh, age friendly, right? Being more age friendly uh, and really positioning folks that are a little bit older in their lives and in their careers as essential people in the workplace, right? So how do we do that uh, with, with, without disrespecting any one community, um, but also bringing the conversation in, uh, bringing younger folks into that conversation and really shaping this conversation around the fact that we're all heading in the same direction and we're all gonna be around for longer. And so I think it's important for us to think about that. The last thing I'll say is this, as we're thinking about this, we're not only thinking about it from an external communication standpoint at BBDO, we're really thinking about how we drive our own uh, initiatives and processes as it relates to um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so just want to give a quick shout out uh, and kudos to AARP for having developed something that we've all signed up for as well, which is their employer pledge employer pledge program uh, that really outlines kind of a series of actions that we really think are the drivers to correcting ageism in the advertising industry more broadly. So I'll pause there. Um, Daisy, I know if you want to pick up from there, but um, again, incredibly proud and excited to be a part of this conversation. Thank you so much, Jason. All right, Daisy, you're up. Thank you. And uh, and we cheated a bit because Jason and I had talked before and I've learned long ago to let all my <laughs> ad colleagues go first because they often have much more beautiful presentations and much more beautiful ways of depicting what I'm about to say um, in more <laughs> terms. Um, but as, as Jason just shared, the ad world in particular, it, they're a powerful force in popular culture. They have the ability to shape what people think, believe, and do. And, and, and so do we in media and entertainment and advice media group, you know, we're a youth media company. We have a very clear point of view on who we wanna reach and who we wanna help discover, um, whose voices we wanna give megaphones to. But that also means that we have to think about age and youth and experience in different ways. Um, mm -hmm. And for us, you know, BMG has, uh, we call it BMG, Vice Media Group. We've undergone a huge transformation in the last couple of years, beginning with our new CEO, Nancy Dubuque, taking the helm in 2018. And her focus has been very much on culture, on diversity, equity, and inclusion, on ensuring that our people and our content, our content reflects our global communities. And in many ways, that began with hiring me as a chief people officer uh, a year and a half ago with a DEI background, because this was a leader who understood that in order to drive culture forward and in order to dive, drive people and systems and processes forward, DEI had to be at the heart of what we were going to be working with and strategizing and being disciplined about. And that piece of it is what I call readiness because I've been focused on just building diversity, equity and inclusion readiness across the organization. And in full transparency, our readiness has been very centered and almost every other dimension but age. Mm. And that's been and, and and that is not surprising in the world of DEI 
and industries as, as all of our terrific speakers have shared so far, because age is rarely included in the DEI equation. And that means that many employee cultures are not learning how age bias and discrimination show up in the workplace, nor are they being schooled on the intersection of age across other dimensions of diversity, including ableism. These are all elements that for many organizations, and you know, I've been at this for a long time as have been Jason and Ithia, um, this hasn't been uh, in weaved into this work as deeply as other dimensions of diversity that are more easily spoken to and frankly, that are easier to quantify and speak about and a bit sexier in the space. Mm -hmm. um, the good news is that we are in the midst of what I call the seismic shift in how companies are addressing diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I think the work of AARP, the work of Lorraine, this, this entire group here is going to help us really get this, get this work right and make sure that it has the right upside for employees, for society, and for the economy. And so I'll share a few of the things that we're doing at Vice. And in full transparency, two-thirds of our employees, nearly two-thirds of our employees are 35 and under. That means that I have a largely managerial workforce that has never managed before and that deeply needs coaching and guidance and support to do this work. So a lot of the work that we're doing at Vice is actually including age as part of the work that we're doing around diversity and inclusion, reminding folks that age discrimination is not new, that ageism exists at every point along the age spectrum because you can be dismissed for being too young as well as for being too old. Um, and that on, the, on that side of the spectrum, the young employees that we're working with, as well as our older employees, either one of them at one point or another in their careers, either before or currently, have felt left out of leadership roles or opportunities as a result of their age. And so it is bringing those groups together to think about what are the right solutions for us? Um, how do we get older and younger employees to recognize that they have unique mountains to climb, but that we can climb them together? And that includes reverse mentoring initiatives. That includes being far more intentional in how we structure teams, how we structure projects, how we structure org design conversations, which are constantly un, you know, being considered as we're all addressing the shifts in, in the industries that we've, we've all faced in the last year and a half. That includes ensuring that our inclusive hiring practices take age into consideration, that our inclusive performance management practices take age into consideration. And so those are all of the elements that we are beginning to include as a way of looking at this holistically and frankly, calling out what needs to be called out. If we learn nothing in the last year and a half is we never talked about race at work, but guess what? That didn't stop it from being an issue for employees. Well, now let's talk about age at work and how it impacts each of us at different stages of our careers. So I'm curious, the, uh, Daisy and, and uh, Jason, in a culture where youth is, I mean, that is the basis for 98% of the advertising that's on TV and the messaging and the programming. And it is almost as if it is ingrained and inherent in who we are. How do you shift the Titanic? I mean, I, don't get me wrong. Obviously it needs to be done when you're talking to me about five generations of people working together. But how do you start to shift the Titanic away from the iceberg? I mean, and I say that because it's a hard shift and turn. I mean, I almost feel like, so are we going to have to do this for another 10 years? And I'm going to be out of time. <laughs> and to get, you know, to get to, to get people to actually not be so focused in, I want to look younger. I want to be younger. I want to, you know, how do you do that? because the mindset is that there's something negative about the aging, whether we say that or not. Um, yeah. I mean, cause it's tall, it, when you go buy shoes, they're telling you that when you're buying pants. It's, so how do you do that? I mean, it's gotta be, there seems, there has to be more than just a commercial that says, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but how do you actually get people to start to make that turn? Yeah, well, I, I can start, you know, from, from our standpoint, um, and that's why I wanted to end my, my remarks with that last bit around what we're doing internally, right? Because, you know, oftentimes uh, uh, clients come to me and ask me, well, is this bot, this ad, is this campaign offensive? 
And then I question them about their internal mechanisms that actually the inputs that go into that output, right? Uh, and that begins with the makeup of their teams. And so one of the things that we're doing um, internally is we are launching an intergenerational uh, study around you know all of the five dimensions of of generations that we have for the first time, as Edna mentioned. And that why is that important? It's important for a couple of reasons. One. I've mentioned, right, getting the right people in the room and getting them to work together is critically important, but it's also about understanding one another, right, and especially in an environment where we've been, I think we've perfected the art form of separation and being socially distanced. Now we're in an environment where we're exploring how we come back together and how we actually collaborate with one another, whether you're in the office or, or not, and I think that has a lot to do with understanding our motivations, what drives us. What what drives a Gen Xer versus a millennial? What drives you know a, a boomer versus a, a Gen Zer? And so it's really understanding that, finding commonality, and then once we do that, then we can start to debunk some of the myths and stereotypes. And then hopefully through those conversations, you know, we can then wind up with a conversation that results in a campaign that you see, uh, you know, both you know multiple generations coming together and having conversations around what is ageism and age as it were. Can I chime in Suzanne. as well? Oh, go, okay. Lorraine, you go first. No, I was going to say, Jason, there's also intentionality, all right? And when I think of the Dove ads, Dove made it a, a, a deliberate decision that it was going to show distinct bodies in distinct colors, in distinct shapes, and distinct ages. And that was intentionality. And I, you know, and that had, and their, their, their profitability hasn't gone down. That intentionality has increased their profitability and because people see themselves more in it. So I think there is something about that. And I wanna go back to something Edna said earlier and then I'll, I'll, I'll turn, turn it right back to you. Um, because the other thing is that older adults, over 45, over 50 have disposable income and they're shoppers and they're consumers and that is being ignored. You know, when you want to buy that grub, sick, whatever those things are that now everybody's buying for their kids so that they can see everything in, in three dimensionals, it is a, it, it's an Edna or a Lorraine the, uh, purchasing yeah. those for their family members. So there is that, that's the absence of that conversation. And I, I put it back to advertising about intentionality and also making aware who is also a consumer. Earthia, so back to you. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm glad you went first. I mean, I was going to say, and, and sorry, I just want to um, clarify a little bit. I work at Just Works. It's a private sector company that is not quite uh, public yet. Um, and what we actually do is um, help small businesses get started. So we just happen to serve a lot of customers who are people who are looking at their next stage in their career. Um, and lifespan, some of those are young and some of those are, you know, sort of further along in terms of their, their work experience. We, so we do have a sense of wanting to serve this very broad uh, customer base that is not syncopated by sort of, you know, how long they've been in a job, but rather by sort of like how they're defining their, their first or next career move or their business. But what I wanted to talk a little bit about was this, this connection from intentionality to outcomes. One of the things that we talk a lot about internally at an organization is not just to have good intentions, but it's also to actually measure outcomes. And so I'm glad that you use that example, Lorraine, because back to Jason and Daisy's point, some of the things that we want to do internally at Just Works is make sure that our intention is leading to the right outcomes, right? So when we talk about sort of bringing people on board into our organization, and we're doing a training around, you know, sort of harassment and discrimination, we include ageism as one of the key pieces that we want our employees to understand. Yes, we do. I will, I will share the video. It's really actually quite great. But it's one of the key pieces that we use because we understand who we're serving as customers, right? We understand who our broader market is and who our potential consumers are. And the second thing that I, I sort of just wanted to add to that as well is that when we are um, at Just Works, sort of trying to explain who we are as a company, when we look at our growth, when we look at the kind of company that we want to be, right, 
we have these very expressed values that are, are about building a culture that is inclusive in every way. And one of the things that we've been very deliberate about is, and there was a chat in the question, uh, there was a question in the chat about this, is to sort of like do away with these like, it, it's almost like a reflexive years of experience note on our job descriptions, right? Mm -hmm. And, and so just to answer your point as to one of the things that we are doing is to not reflexively go to the like three years experience or five years experience or 15 years experience, but actually to talk about the kind of skill sets and the kind of person that we think you ought to be in terms of skill set, in terms of orientation for a role, right? It is, we're talking more fully about who we think you are as a person in order to, you know, sort of be successful in this position. And so it takes it away from this sort of age piece into more about like, what are your qualifications, your skill sets, and the quality of the way in which you work in order to be able to exercise this role. So intentionality and outcomes connecting. Okay. You know, and I think uh, 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 Tia, you kind of talked about some of the things I was going to ask you about. Um, a little bit can about I, the whole question of the I'm sorry, because I oh, yeah, go ahead. No problem, want, Daisy. Because you, your question was an important one, and your sense mm -hmm. of oh my god, how long is this going to take? <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a really critical piece that I that I want to chime in because here's why I am optimistic, and you know, and none of us wouldn't be optimistic <laughs> if we weren't doing the work that we're mm -hmm. doing. But I do think it's important for us to recognize that this the pandemic has impacted company culture and standards yeah. for advancement and managerial expectations in many different ways, including the sense of accelerating this change that we've all been talking about. So, so I, I do wanna remind us, and many of us have been doing this work for a really long time, is that there's not just new commitment that we have to, to, uh, to Irtia's point, we have to level up those new commitments with real actions and real strategies. And this is, this is the example that I give to my team all the time because we have a sales team as all media and entertainment companies do. But if, you know, if we had a problem with sales, we would not try to fix it by holding deep, sincere conversations about how much everyone values sales. You would not develop sort of you know, celebrate sales month. You would not, um, you know, you, what you would do would be big, you know, create basic business tools, mm -hmm. evidence what's going wrong, metrics that measure your progress and fixing it, and we need to use those same tools to solve DEI. And I do think, and, and ageism within DEI, I do think that organizations are finally figuring out there's a place for culture and changes and a lot of the elements that are, that are worthwhile, I don't wanna diminish them, that we have been doing for a long time. And there's a place for applying true business principles that have been tried and true mm -hmm. while we engage in this amazing time of experimentation that we're living in. We have That's these- cycles of testing, of learning, of iterating, of figuring out what works and what doesn't. And that moment that we're in right now, I think is going to help us accelerate. So you don't have to wait 10 years to see this work being integrated. You can start seeing it now. But again, to what Jason and Irtia are saying is the intentionality, is the structure, is the process, and it's the standardization of this work in a way that it hasn't been before. And, and I would add, Daisy, to that point, I mean, clearly Daisy and I talk a lot. So part of our like Sunday brunch <laughs> conversation, which is that we've never also collectively been through quite this time period where we saw change happen so quickly and mm -hmm. almost, you know, sort of in every corner of the world. So now we all have this sort of like collective understanding that actually change is not quite as hard as we fictionalized it to be, right? Mm -hmm. And we can have this conversation in a different moment in time where we can actually say, well, actually, yes, like three months of protests had like a significant impact on what we could do in life. And so maybe another three months of another change could have an even greater impact, right? Like our understanding of change and how much work it takes has changed significantly from a year ago. And it is with that momentum, I believe that we're moving forward to change the equation. Yeah. I will say, I, I totally agree. I will say that the duration or the stickiness of the change is what I think is, is sort of unknown. We've seen shifts. I'm not quite, uh, I, 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 I I, I hope that DE&I doesn't become um, sort of a, 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 a catchy, nice thing to do. We take superficial um, changes and then we ballyhoo them, but the underpinnings of what's really happening don't change. I, I, so I do think this is a, it's a trite phrase, but it's a, mar it's a marathon, not a sprint. 
And really, you know, um, Daisy, you talked about metrics really being able to show not only that we moved, but we sustained that movement. We sustained, not a blip. I think we're seeing a blip right now, honestly. And, and our challenge as DE&I uh, practitioners is to make sure that we sustain those changes over time. Yeah, and because sometimes for me, I, I I also feel like there's this uncomfortable competition between younger workers and older workers. Oh, absolutely. That, that you know, sometimes you have younger workers that's smart enough to know they're learning from these older workers, and then you have younger, older people that don't want to deal with the young people because they don't know what they're doing. It's just a, it's almost if they're, if they're in a fight together. Yeah. And part of that issue to me seems to be the way we are socialized early on to think of ourselves in terms of age and experience, I guess, within the workplace. Right. And it's so ingrained over right. such a period of time. And obviously I'm not saying it's not something that we can get over because look, it wasn't too long ago that guys didn't want us working in the workplace right. with them. No disrespect, right. Jason. But, <laughs> but you know, that was a fight too. Right, um, right, and, right. And, and so we've gotten over it. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Um, you know, I, I have three millennial uh, children and they talk about the workplace all the time and, and ageism and age discrimination goes both ways. I'm very careful how I use the term entitlement now because for mill millennials, that is absolutely a trigger. Everybody has painted them as sort of the entitled generation. They want quick raises, they want quick promotions. And we've sort of painted a broad brush uh, that, that is really ages, you know, that may be individuals show up that way, but we should not be saying that everybody of a certain age cohort reacts and responds to the workplace in that way. So it really does uh, cross all, all, all age bands. We got a lot of fixing to do, don't we? We yeah, do. But, but Sandra, you said it before, and, and I think Daisy and Earth just said it before, and I, it's all about training. It's like what training is occurring. You do management training at all levels, and that has to be part of the management training so that you can have these five generations in a workplace be productive yeah. to the bottom line of the company. And yeah. to do that, you, you need to do that cross training and debunk some of these myths that we each have about each other. Yeah. And let's also be clear, Jason wouldn't have been, Jason's firm and the amazing work that he's doing wouldn't be happening if this work wasn't happening internally as well. Exactly. And so that's why having someone like Jason drive this work is so critical. And Irtia just works in supporting all of these organizations that are now from the very beginning building this into their DNA. Um, so again, I'm, I'm going to be the optimist here today is these are, <laughs> It's it's not, I, I think we've talked about this for so long that we, we tend to believe like it hasn't changed so it will never change. There There is a solution to this. There's a structured way of approaching this work. And we've, we've sold ourselves a bill of goods of like, this will never happen, but we have lived through so much change in our lifetimes already. And the pace of change is accelerating so rapidly and both the young and the not so young, <laughs> to find the right terms for all of this language, all of us are mixed now building this and I think that that's, that's what's exciting about this. That, that's what, that it is, you're right. They have, you know, I have young people that are constantly sort of rolling their eyes and going like, why do I have to listen to this person? And then I have the same from older folks saying, like, these young ones just don't get it. It's like, but when you put them in a room together, it's magic. <laughs> when, you see, when you see the intellect, the experience, the expertise, along with the know-how of what's on the ground, what's next, what is, you know, what the joy of discovery is for our audiences. When you see those two pieces together, that's when you know, we have been leaving money on the table all along. Let's get this mm -hmm. right. Well, yeah, that, that's because I would think to some extent they're in the room together and they've been forced to let, they are now forced to let go of whatever their preconceived notions were and actually look at each other in the face and, and, and work with each other. Um, can I, I have a question uh, for you, Lorraine. Uh, from uh, Robin Talley. Um, she says, working in New York City government in the DNI space, the conversation about age is often associated with attrition, separation, and not a proactive approach to mentorship, a uh, hybrid schedule relating to retention, marketing, and branding. Any thoughts on that? Oh my God, thank you for that question. <laughs> I forgot who was the person who asked it, but whoever you are, Robin I want Talley. you to know something. I, we just launched in New York City under the, under the Department for the Aging, something called Silver Stars. 
And it was precisely because we started seeing, you know, we're losing this talent uh, because people are retiring. And what we've done is created a program where we can bring back retirees to the system. They can work for a certain number of hours, earn pay without impacting their pension. And it's really recapturing some of that talent, but it's also the ability to start training um, other people so that we don't lose that history, that experience, you know, in, in, in any field in private, in the public sector. So it is one of, it's, it's, it's a program. We just started it uh, uh, not too long ago. It's going to be under Maritza's uh, watch. And so it's something that we are very excited about because we see this as the first step in something called like AmeriCorps. So we wanted to call it Silver Corps, where <laughs> we can start bringing and introducing people who are not ready to fully retire. And people are not able to fully retire for a variety of reasons. One is economics and one is I still have some, you know, I'm 71. I still have a good two or three years. I, well, maybe not three. A, a good two years that I want to give back. And Lorraine, 10. You and 10 so, more than uh, years. Well, really, <laughs> really. <laughs> but anyway, but, but when you start thinking about that, there is this opportunity that we have to create for people who are not ready to mm. fully retire. But we also have to create uh, opportunities for other people to move and grow also. So it is using that combination of something like Silver Stars, like Silver Core, you know, to create those opportunities. I think I a, jump in there really quickly because I think there's an opportunity and there might have been a question in the chat about um, about this. So maybe I'll tackle two two birds with one stone. But um, you know, I think COVID definitely presents an opportunity for us to you know upskill or reskill our workforce, right? So in an environment where industries have come and gone and may not come back, you know, is there an opportunity for us to look at folks with secondary and tertiary skills that you know long have long have long been you know laid dormant is there an opportunity for us to upskill and, and redevelop those uh those opportunities for a new job market right now so i think that's also a responsibility that we all collectively have yeah uh, yeah when you start listening looking to all the conversation about supply chain issues and to me there seems to be a, 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 a very wide space for us to start doing some of that. I have a question uh, here uh, from Carol Davis, which I think is sort of where I think we're all, maybe I, I'm since I'm not actually in the space you guys are in, but I have this question too. She says, how can we raise awareness of the roots of generational, generationalism? Separating people into groups according to age started decades ago for ease of administration. Many analysts use generational labels and are unaware of how it perpetuates ageist stereotypes. Any thoughts from any of you? That's a Jason. Jason. <laughs> she's, she's elected Jason. But we we have we we're sort of some of that was just because it was easy to break people up and then it had consequences. And so now we're in a position to try to rework the system we had because we're finding that it actually doesn't work for us as well as we, you know, we're, we thought it did, that we're, we're missing a lot of people, we're leaving them out. And mm -hmm. I guess that's the, that, that's the trick that we have to start addressing this whole, she called it generational, generationalism mm -hmm. early on. Yeah, um, it's a, I mean, I think, Jason, do you want to tackle it or I can start and you can continue? Edna also had Edna. Edna as, as oh, Edna. Edna, Edna, you go, go ahead, please. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'll, no, I'll I, I, was, I was simply going to say, you know, it's it's kind of like a, it, it's sort of like a problem and an opportunity in one, right? And we experience it across all sort of dimensions of diversity, equity, and inclusion and, and sort of identity um, identification, right? So, you know, in, in some respects, we want to measure and have data in order to understand what the problem is, where it exists, and how you might tackle it. I think what tends to happen is that a lot of companies can be lazy about it, and they just collect the data, which is, by the way, not a way of understanding what the future holds, but just sort of like a look back at sort of what the past or current situation is. And they don't do something that kind of Jason alluded to, which is to really try and understand what the story is and what the indicators are 
about what issues need to be addressed in the organization. So what I would say is that it would be great if we were more disciplined about not having such lazy labels as Gen Xers and you know millennials and whatever the labels are, but instead understanding how to still collect the data and understand how more experienced workers say fair inside an organization versus workers with less managerial experience and what problems do we need to tackle? And I could give a thousand examples, but just basically I think we don't wanna not have data, we just need to be better about actually using the data to change and improve internally organizations. And I would add just quickly to eat is can we like this is this is something I say almost on a daily basis. The semantic tyranny of this work is real. And we get so caught up in in terms that mean something different here, something different there. And I was like, and I think that it's when we when we're looking at data clearly, when we're using terms clearly, when we're debunking what we mean by words, and we're, you know, and you know, this whole concept of like, am I I'm gonna use a diversity, but not not inclusion and belonging, but not ageism. It's like, mm -hmm. let's look at, you know, the, the, whole, the whole work that we are doing around, you know, around diversity, equity, inclusion, the beauty of it in the last year and a half is that it really has been about identity formation. And that mm -hmm. is complex and nuanced and changes and shifts. But what doesn't shift in organizations is that you work with people <laughs> for the most part. And that people, people, you know, their experiences, what they bring to the organization, it's somewhat you know, if you are using, you know, smart and thoughtful tools, you can define how, you know, what, who they are based on how they define themselves, what's important to them, what they mm -hmm. need in the workplace and what your workplace needs them to do. And if we can just get to those basic places, we spend too much time battling the language piece sometimes, and mm -hmm. that enough actually doing the work and getting to the solutions that our people need. I think you can see from the chat, Daisy, people love that term, semantic tyranny. Yeah, tyranny. tyranny. So I'm going to use that. I, I made a note. I'm going to use that. Um, I'm not defending the categories, but I have a slide um, that, you know, we didn't have time for the day. But when you look at the different experiences, I do think we tend to look at generations in a very siloed approach. But when you look at, but I think they, they were, were, they came out of trying to capture the different experiences of these age groups. Which wars, what technology, what you know, um, um, uh, you know, shifts were happening in the country. And when you compare, even you know, uh, uh, millennials and Gen Zs, and you look at that, there are these seismic things that have happened over the last hundred years that are worth noting and understanding. But I absolutely agree that we've taken too much of a siloed approach to talking about the generations, but it's really interesting to peel back where those terms came from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I have a, an interesting question here from um, Wendy Zinman Zakar. She, will, she says she believes there would have to be some incentives to both nonprofit organizations <laughs> and for-profit organizations to get the kind of change, I guess, in a way that we're seeking. Training is great, but she th thinks, you know, you got to figure out a way to get people to, I guess, uh, you know, set this in motion. I have an answer to part, part an answer to that. You know, one mm -hmm. of the things that I talk to our clients often, and I'm going to use uh, an external, uh, an external facing lens for a minute. Um, it's a dollars and cents issue, right? When you think about the automotive industry, as an example, within advertising, I think it's 56% of, um, of, of buyers of automobiles are 55 and over. Yet, when you look at advertising, you see young people left and right. You don't see them reflected. And so when you think about that as it relates to their business, how much money are they leaving on the table by not getting this right? So you can't expect automotive industry or companies to do the right thing for the sake of doing the right thing. They're not nonprofits. Uh, but if they are for-profit businesses, how do you shape this? And how do you put it in the context of business in the language of business and say, look, by not focusing on this community, you're leaving a lot of money on the table. And so uh, you can see a lot of eyes pop open once you frame it in that context. Yeah, I mean, you know, money talks <laughs> and we all know what walks, right? <laughs> Another question that was, and I, uh, maybe Lorraine or uh, Edna, you could speak to this. Um, the question was what steps have been taken to legislatively address the issue to, to eliminate ageism? 
Well, AARP has done a lot in terms of uh, age discrimination, both uh, federally and state house by state house across the country. We have 53 state offices and, and we have a certain set of priorities um, that, that guide our strategic work and age discrimination and age inclusion has been a priority for the last for, for, for really for, for, for forever, really. So there, you know, uh, a lot of work that's been done. We always have lobbyists. We have a dedicated lobbyist team looking at and piecing out what comprises age discrimination and how we can um, fight it. Uh, you know, uh, uh, for example, um, the uh, recent stimulus payments that were um, uh, distributed during the height of the pandemic. At one point, it was required that you couldn't get a stimulus payment unless you had filed a tax return in the previous year. Well, a lot of older adults, especially older poor adults, because of their income levels, they didn't file a tax return. We were right in the front saying, absolutely not. You're discriminating, discriminating against older people who need this money the most. And we actually got that reversed. So there are probably 20, 30 victories that you don't hear about on an annual basis, big and small, that AERP um, is working. And we're also working, we've talked a lot about the advertising agency um, um, industry. We've also talked about, um, we've also focused on, for example, media, the print media. We've been working with Allura and Condé Nast and some of the uh, magazines for years now to try to get them to, to, uh, to not use, for example, anti-aging, um, anti-aging treatments, anti-aging this, because again, that insidious, uh, negative connotation um, uh, uh, was prevalent. And, you know, we've had success in that. So we work legislatively, policy-wise, targeting advertisers, and we do a lot with advertising agencies. And as Jason has said, certainly what we try to do with our advertising, uh, uh, it, we want to make sure that it's an example of what to do and what not to do. Uh, and Sandra, New York City has strengthened its age discrimination laws and policies uh, to make sure that the age discrimination is broadened and, and much better defined. And uh, like Edna said, we targeted media companies because there was one major media company in New York um, and to look at uh, age discrimination within media, particularly targeted at women at women and then and women of color. So yeah. it's been one of those things in partnership with New York City and the City Council. We've been looking at that for the last year and a half. Um, and words matter and definitions matter. And, you know, as Toni Morrison says, you know, the definer uh, does, it's the define that determines how they should be defined, not, mm. not the, def not the, what is it? Not the other one. Whatever the other one is that makes the definition. <laughs> the definee? Or is not the yeah. definer? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Okay. I, I, but anyway, Toni Morrison has this whole thing about owning the definition and those in the category are the ones that should define themselves. So um, I wonder, there's there's one piece that's interesting, and um, and Jason uh, and and Eddie, they're also if they are also familiar with this, but media and entertainment companies have, as of the last couple of years, started building inclusion standards in their work from a production perspective, but also from an editorial perspective. And we mm -hmm. have that advice media group. And within our inclusion standards from a creative lens, there, there is language around what our editorial teams can and shouldn't use um, around ageism and a whole host of other identifying factors. And I think that that's another element where you can build some structural and systemic change in organizations that AARP and your work as well, Lorraine, can push organizations and just by asking, what are your inclusion standards and what do they say around the agent? Mm -hmm. And what your reporting requirements are around those reporting standards, is, especially as more media and entertainment companies. And Daisy knows I have experience with this. I worked at Time Warner and helped them design their first sort of reporting metrics for their um, production reports, right? Um, what do you include in those and how do you influence, you know, the way in which that reporting happens and what language you use, et cetera? And the good news is that a lot of these have become public, so they're adding continued pressure to other organizations to do that. Yes, um, and so it's actually quite a standard question to ask for them now. They should be able to provide them to you. And if not, then you can serve as an agent for change for them to help yeah. them find the right language to include. And AARP has been a leader, and Jason, you know this, and Edna knows this better than any of us, to so this bet. AARP has been a leader in acknowledging those companies who take the step. 
those who take the boat, we have movies for grownups. We have a variety of categories for employers, you know, who have best practices. And so that's another way uh, to incent companies to be want to be part of that class. Mm -hmm. Here's a question from a, an Ari Wittenberg. Um, she said, I, I really love this conversation but I worry that the reality of the situation on the ground is much more dire than what is being discussed here. I've worked in several industries, including the nonprofit and private spaces, and the pervasive issue is that when you hit your 40s, the countdown towards downward socioeconomic mobility begins. I've seen it happen to colleagues and watched it happen to myself. The number one reason I joined the civil service is to have a safe, stable job to age into, and I'm only 41. I know so many people who begin, who, oh, I'm sorry, uh, who begin, uh, what, in the, what in the heck? I can't read. During the Great Recession have never recovered from losing past jobs. And then let's not forget older workers are more expensive, their insurance costs are higher, and companies know that older workers might have families and aren't willing to work 80 hours a week for $40,000 a year. Um, no, I hope we haven't understated that she's absolutely right. Um, the, the, we have not, and it, it's, it's, it's bad for all older workers, it's especially bad for black and brown and, and, and other workers of color. Um, there's lots of statistics and I think we're going to see, we, we will, we, I think older workers have seen an income loss throughout the pandemic that we won't recover from. So it is, it's clearly, uh, 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 this, this problem has not been solved. Um, and this is really people, and, and the whole notion of the gig economy, and I think we're gonna see more studies of older workers um, forced into a gig economy, which you know, on the one hand sounds glamorous, and I know lots of personal friends who have thrived, but it's, it's hard, it's hard. You don't have this level of benefits that you need. You don't have the protections. A lot of these people are paid under the table or whatever. So absolutely, it is not a, a rosy scenario. I think we've been talking about the best in class companies. But one, I think you're talking about people who get pushed out of companies and then can't find a way back in. And that, I think that's gonna get worse before it gets better. I think the pandemic has absolutely pulled the rug out from under uh, older workers in a way that I worry we won't be able to uh, recover from. I have a point of view on that as well. I mean, I, I agree with that, Edna, but I also I'll look at the silver lining here. And, and when I look at, you know, two groups in a post-pandemic world that I would expect to see an uptick in hiring for, for example, are folks with disabilities and folks that are a little bit older, right? Why do I say that? Now that you've eliminated and you've proved that you can be anywhere in the world and work remotely and be as productive, Folks with disabilities, you don't have to consider the, the commute factor of that, right? The, the, the making an office accessible, for example. Same thing with older workers, right? That might have families as, as the, you know, the person that posed the question. You know, folks that have families, um, oftentimes that, that family presents a challenge when you have kids in school, when you have, you know, extracurricular activities. And so being able to work remotely now alleviates some of these issues. I would expect to see, you know, hopefully a, a slight uptick in hiring in those communities uh, because of the pandemic. I hope you're right. I hope you're right. I have a, another question here from Whitney Estrin. How would you address industries with predominantly white leadership over the age of 60 that have held those roles and salaries for decades and a more racially diverse pool of manager level employees who are frustrated about not having opportunities to advance? And that's right at the mix of all the work that we do, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's fundamentally the, the say, biggest. Welcome to America. Yeah. Um, I, I do want to say, uh, yeah, and, and, and I'll answer that quickly, but um, to Jason's point and, and Edna's, I, I do think that I'm, I'm of two minds in, in this space. The fact is that Jason, Evie, and I represent companies that provide, provide much stronger safety nets for employees than most mm -hmm. other organizations and industries. And so that, that I think, Ari, is an important question that you posed and, um, and a reality that we all face, that industry mm -hmm. and even companies themselves are mixed in those, um, in those uh, benefits that we have uh, somewhat grown accustomed to, but now realize we absolutely necessarily need them. But I will say, Sandra, that it, we don't know what the next side of work is going to look like into the next year and a half. So we're going through this tumultuous change in the way of work. And mm -hmm. I do think like Jason, 
that there are a lot of work, you know, groups of workers that will have more opportunities than others, but there's still a lot of work to be done to ensure that we're creating the right access and opportunity for those workers to find their way into these organizations and to gain the benefits and supports that they need to be able to deliver on their work effectively. Mm -hmm. And I will say to the, the question around older workers being more expensive, I think every worker is more expensive right now. I was like, that's the nature of the market that we're in. I, you know, I have, I have individuals with very little experience negotiating at the same rate as I have executives <laughs> negotiating for their executive packages. So this is, we, we all in this space are going through a moment of complete reimagination of what the, what work looks like, which is what excites me about being able to reimagine and redefine these pieces for all classes of, uh, of employees. Now, to answer your question around what do we say? I was like, that's the challenge, right? It is about leaders who have, for a predominantly white male, cisgendered, heterosexual individuals who have held their spots for far too long and not created enough space for others to move up the ranks. Now, the good news is that there's a lot of great talent moving up the ranks, and there's a lot of great talent ready and able to take on these leadership positions. So I think you, you're starting to see some leaders who have both by reflection or by pressure, um, created space and opportunity for others to come along. But I do think that we've seen, and, and then we've seen also others who have been waiting for quite some time for these opportunities and are just going up and opening their own businesses and creating their own opportunity. Mm -hmm. So instead of this great resignation, which is what I've told my team, we're gonna stop using the word great resignation, Turnover tsunami is the other one we were using for a while. Um, we're, we're now, see, you know, semantic tyranny is really all around me when you work with, with, with writers. But we're, we're starting to use the terminology, the great reshuffle, which is that talent is, there's not that they're leaving, is that they're finding new homes and new places that work better for them. And when that happens, you start seeing organizations rethink their recruitment, their retention, their advancement policies, because we need workers. And so I think that that, that, that change, change and shift is also happening. And we're, we're at a great place to be able to reimagine that. Okay. I, I had to go back to the, I, I, that question about the, I just have to say that just because you're 60 and you've been doing that, doesn't the thought that just because you're a lower manager and you didn't move up, then maybe it's time to move on to somewhere where there's space. I mean, I'm not saying all those guys that are up there know what they're doing, but just because you're 60 and you've had the job doesn't mean you should suddenly be shuttled out for the younger person that we're, I mean, I, that, that's, yeah, that's Sandra, exactly I think, what we're talking about. That in itself yeah, is ages. Yeah, I think that's a great, that's a great point, Sandra. And, and I think the, the other thing that I would subtly say is implied in that question is that there's like a finite number of jobs or opportunities for every person that mm -hmm. aren't available to other folks. And one of the things that I think in this great reshuffle we're learning is that there are actually other avenues that we can pursue, right? Yeah. Um, and that there are other spaces that need to be opened up. I mean, like one, the most immediate one that comes to mind is how like difficult it was two years ago to diversify boards, you know, for public companies. And yeah. then like how all of a sudden there are just <laughs> so many more qualified women of color, you know, of any age or persuasion or sort of career um, experience that are now suddenly available to be appointed to boards, right? And, mm -hmm. and that, you know, was like a perception of something that was like very close and there were like a limited number of opportunities. And it turns out that it wasn't that, right? It, it was just yeah. a change in our estimation right in our valuation um of who was qualified and an understanding and pressure. That, exactly <laughs> and, pressure. and pressure and so i would agree with you that i think the question is more about like how do you create pressure in those spaces to value right more different sets of skills and experiences to create additional opportunities it's not about moving people out because they've reached a certain level of tenure. That's a good, that's a good word. I'm using that. A level of <laughs> tenure in their careers, right? That should not necessitate them moving on. Yeah. I you do guys, think we're, we're talking about um, uh, very, uh, 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 and I agree with everything, but we're talking about middle to upper income careers and jobs. And I don't think we want to lose sight of a lot of the optimism and choices that we're talking about for low income workers don't really exist. And I think we've got to create solutions that cross the spectrum and not just focus on um, elite jobs that we're all so blessed to be in. Mm -hmm.
I, th I think that's it's a it's a really valuable point, and I think go going that's that's I think exactly where Ethia is 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 heading with her point, and that there are multiple avenues for mm -hmm. gaining both economic freedom, wealth generation, career mobility, and I think for many of us we have traditionally thought there's only one path, right? So there's just mm -hmm. a linear path mm -hmm. to move up, and what we found in the last couple of years is that there's actually multiple paths, mm -hmm. and that's that's what this new way of work that I'm, I'm actually really excited about as complex and nuanced as it is, because mm -hmm. it is creating avenues and it is creating different demands for both skill sets, for our own understanding of what our careers and professional mobility should look like. And I do think that there's a space there, but you're absolutely right, Edna, in the privilege that many of us are in being mm -hmm. able to have this conversation versus just being able to find what the next paycheck is going to look right. like. Exactly. Yeah, okay. I mean, I, I would just, sorry, just to sort of add another little tidbit is that our companies also employ a swath of people, right? That they're not all sort of white collar professional services folks, right? You also have hourly workers. I mean, we do at Just Works. We also have hourly workers. We have workers who like for them, Just Works is the first place they've ever worked. And for some, it's like probably the last place they will think of working at, right? There is a swath and there is a difference of opportunity and, and a difference in terms of income level and opportunity. So I, I, we don't mean to diminish that. I think that what we do want to present are sort of some of the most promising opportunities for us to really sort of like accelerate change, if you were, will, in our society. I'm going to have to step out now, and I'm terribly sorry, but I do oh, think okay. that we haven't spoken about, and obviously very biased because that's a big part of our workforce, but is the, the recent increase in unionization in organizations. Mm -hmm. And I think there's an, there's an element there from an age perspective that hasn't been discussed because in most organizations, at least the organizations that I've that I've worked with, and you know, and advice, it's it, you know, it's it's the it's the younger workforce, the freelance workforce, is the contingency management piece of this work that hasn't really addressed this, and this is employees demanding and saying we're done with not being treated well. Um, here's you know, here's what you know, here's what our demands are, um, and I think that there's a there's a topic there that. Um, from an age conversation and AARP, I think could have a really interesting topic uh, of discussion. And I'm really sorry I have to jump out. Um, That's okay, that. Daisy. Thank you so much. In Thank fact, I want to thank all of our panelists. Um, and I want to tell all the folks that joined us today to listen to this important conversation that all of your questions are going to be answered. And we're going to circle back with you via email if we didn't get a chance to discuss the question that you asked today. And at this point, I would like to introduce Susan Weinstock, who is the VP for Financial Resilience with AARP. Susan? Hello. Susan, Hello. here you go. Yep, I'm here. Hi. Thank you so much, Sandra. And thank you to our wonderful panel. This has been an amazing conversation. And I just want to uh, point out a couple of things as I was taking notes that really stuck out to me. So I'll, I'll just throw a couple of these phrases out there because I thought they were terrific. Ability is ageless. I love that. Um, the intersection of age across other aspects of diversity and inclusion and how important it is to have that full intersection. Uh, somebody else mentioned the importance of in intentionality. Uh, somebody else said stickiness of change is unknown. Uh, and then another person talked about metrics and the importance of su sustained change but but you have to measure them through the metrics. Uh, the, that 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 word about the the term semantic tyranny is great. Uh, the great reshuffle rather than the great resignation, and then that it's really about looking for other avenues to pursue rather than to leaving the job that you have. Um, and you know, as we've heard today, age is and should be an integral part of every com every company's you know uh, employers' diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. Unfortunately, what we know and what we talked about today is it's often not the case. It's often the overlooked uh, uh, discrimination that we are concerned about. We have an ARP pledge program, and Jason mentioned it during the panel, where we work with employers to educate them about the value of older workers, the value of a multi-generational workforce, and how uh, important it is to hire based on ability regardless of age. And the reason why that's important is one, it's the law, and two, it's important to have that multi-generational workforce. We have over 1,300 employers that have signed our pledge, and they're going to follow that, that, uh, that lead. 
Um, it may not seem like a big deal, but what we think is important is that this is a public affirmation. These folks are saying, yes, we are here. We understand ageism and we understand that we need to fight against that. Um, but let's talk about why multi-generational workforces are important. First of all, the research shows that multi-generational uh, workforces increase productivity, they, uh, they increase engagement, and they lower absenteeism. Aren't those things that every employer wants? That is so important. So having those multi-generational teams are, 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 are critical to a successful workforce. And we know that older workers bring those all important soft skills to the workforce. We hear from our pledge companies, yeah, we can train older workers on the, on the uh, we can train anybody on the hard skills, but those soft skills that older workers bring, the empathy, the listening, the collaboration, the teamwork, those are the things that we can't train on and that they're really important to the success of our workforce. Um, we, I heard we got a question about resources. So let me make a, a say a couple of things about that. Um, if you want to learn more about the AARP uh, Employer Pledge Program, go to aarp.org slash employer pledge to see more about that. Um, and I should mention that we have a guide to building multi-generational teams. And to see that, uh, if you go to campaigns.aarp.org slash multi-generational dash workforce, you will see our, uh, our guide to how to build successful multi-generational teams. Um, we also had a question about training, and I want to mention that we've just started offering our online uh, learning platform. Uh, go to arp.org slash work skills. You'll see that. And we have a number of free courses that people can take. Uh, and then let me just give one more piece of uh, dice, and then I'm going to stop. Uh, and that is when you're building and looking at employee resource groups, don't make them based on generation. Make them across generation. So build a multi-generational employer, res employer resource group rather than one that's just for millennials or just for baby boomers. Because um, having them together is a much better way to do that. So anyway, let me once again say thank you so much. If folks go to aarp.org slash work, if I've thrown too many uh, 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 URLs at you, aarp.org slash work, you'll find all of the things that I have mentioned. And now again, let me say so much thank you to uh, to Lorraine and her team, uh, they've been just great, uh, to Colin with uh, Public Private Strategies and to our panelists. And I'm gonna turn it over to Lorraine to uh, give us our concluding remarks and thank you again. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Susan, it was, it was great. Um, thank you all. I've been inspired, invigorated, renewed, and uh, can do a lot of reimagining because of this conversation. So. Uh, thank you all for this panel. Um, my gratitude to ABC New York and to Sandra Bookman. You've been an exceptional moderator. I love the way you just threw yourself totally into the conversation, and that was great. Uh, of course, to AARP and AARP New York, Edna, it's any, any time with you is a joy for me. Susan and Beth, same. And to the extraordinary panel that we look forward to elevating our work in this conversation, Daisy from Vice Media, Erthia from Just Works. I just, I'm, I'm always in, inspired by these two women. And Jason uh, to, uh, from B, BBDO Worldwide. Jason, we're looking to you to start putting out those images that make sense so that we can have an age inclusive conversation uh, across the workplace as well as in the media. Uh, I want to um, applaud all of you too for starting this conversation in our respective arenas because we are all required, uh, all our voices are required to make sure that these public partnerships work and also change the dialogue. And of course, I would re be remiss if I don't thank Maritza Arroyo, who's our Assistant Commissioner for Public-Private Partnerships, who put this whole panel together and this afternoon. And to you, the audience, thank you for joining. It is our hope that you leave today armed with information and new tools. Jason gave you the name of a book. Um, Daisy gave you some structural questions that we can start asking corporations. Lots of great information so that we can create multi-generational workplaces, but also a multi-generational society that works for all. 
I'm asking each and every one of you to join us. Join us in this battle that we call combat ageism. Every hashtag, every time we see combat ageism, if you see it, call it out. If you feel it, call it out. This is one where we need to stand together and stand um, as allies, even those who are not in the age category. That's how we change the conversation. That's how we move forward and make sure that we have an age inclusive society. I wanna thank all of you again for participating.